Hello everyone, this is Kyung Hoon Ban from Iowa State University. I'm a PhD candidate and thank you so much for having here, uh, uh, coming over here. And thank you for uh, all the members from the Zoom meeting as well. And uh, yeah, uh, I hope uh, you guys, uh, I hope you uh, enjoy my presentation and I hope you find this is useful for your future research because it's about the difference in differences technique or DID technique, which is uh, one of the most popular technique in the uh, applied economics. Uh, and uh, let me begin with the main identification challenge for the observational studies, including DID technique, uh, where we don't have any experimental data set. So this is, these are the uh, example and uh, we, uh, for example, if, let's say we are interested in uh, identifying the outcomes for uh, some variable. Let's say this is the equilibrium price data set. Uh, over time for the control group and we are in uh, and let's say the uh, event occurred period between zero and one and we're interested in how much uh, how large is the impact for the treated group or let's say this is the uh, Iowa state and if we have a uh, control group states let's say this is uh, Minnesota and we can average out them um, to see the average effect uh, First, so what we are interested in is that uh, how large is the uh, treatment effect on the treated for the green line here. So the naive approach would be just comparing the outcome variable in period one between control group and the treatment group, but that will not work. And the reason is because they are different group, right? Uh, even before the treatment occurred, like for example, period negative one or period zero, they are different in level, which means that if we just compare the uh, uh, outcome variable, mean outcome variable in the period one, that is comparing these two quantities and which, is, which can be obtained by running the simple OLS regression of outcome variable on the treatment indicator D here, which is going to be this uh, difference between the outcome variable it's not equal to the average effect, uh, average uh, treatment effect on the treated, which we call ATT here. The, why? Why is it not? Uh, 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 in order to identify ATT, ATT correctly, we need to know uh, if there was no treatment on the treated group, how, uh, how would the outcome variable evolved in period one? So that's represented in uh, this uh, potential outcome model notation here we have parenthesis zero that means uh, what if this outcome variable will be if they are not treated even if they are in uh, even if uh, they are in the treat uh, treatment group and if we can observe this quantity we can get att correctly however the problem is that the data set does not provide this hypothetical quantity because the treatment group is already treated in the period of one that means uh, ATT is never observed correctly. So here comes the uh, assumptions and the standard DID assumption, uh, standard DID technique assumes the famous parallel trend assumption, which is this red dotted line would have followed the same trend as the control group of this blue line. That's how DID approach identifies ATT, but that's, uh, that could be not true. And, in order to uh, relax that assumption, we want to take a look at that parallel trend assumption in terms of the selection biases. So I define here the selection bias as the difference between the out uh, potential outcome variable uh, or the outcome of untreated uh, values between two groups. For example, this gap here, SB1, will be the selection bias in period one, but that's not observed in the data set. And if we follow the uh, standard DID assumption, uh, DID approach, the standard DID assumption is stating that we can obtain the, oh yeah, we can obtain the selection bias in period zero or period negative one. And that will be the same in the period one. And the DID approach or the parallel trend assumption is assuming that selection bias in period one will be the same as that of period zero or period negative one. So using this assumption, the standard DID approach identifies average treatment effect on the treated 
as the difference between the standard OLS estimate minus the selection bias of period zero. However, what if we don't have the parallel trend assumption from the data set? Or even worse, what if we don't observe the parallel trend assumption from the pretreatment period data set? Let's say we have this, uh, this data set here where we don't see the uh, equivalence between selection biases between uh, two pretreatment periods here. So instead of just picking some specific or averaging out that uh, all the selection biases in the pretreatment period, we propose to uh, uh, provide a set for selection bias or interval for the selection bias in period one that can be consisting of all the selection biases available in the data set. For example, here, according to our method, selection bias one now can be as small as the selection bias in period zero, or it could be as large as selection bias in period negative one. And accordingly, we can now partially identify ATT, or differently, we can set identify ATT. Here, now ATT is no longer a single point, but now we identify this as a region or interval. That's the expenses of uh, uh, realizing the parallel trend assumption. So let me summarize main result first. So first of all, we partially identify the average treatment effect on the treated, even if the parallel trend assumption fails, or even worse, if we don't, we fail to uh, uh, verify the pre-treatment period parallel trend assumption, we can use our method to set, at least to set identify ATT. Secondly, uh, there is another paper from Rambach and Ross 2020. Uh, they are also exploiting uh, some variation in the pre-treatment period uh, by, re by, by relaxing the parallel trend assumption, but our, uh, our our method have some advantage over their method because uh, our method does not require any selection of arbitrarily tuning parameters. We just allow the data set determine uh, the identified set itself without uh, uh, intervention of any researcher's choice. And finally, our approach is general enough to uh, be extendable to uh, any related uh, methodologies such as uh, multi, multiple pre, uh, post-treatment period event studies analysis or the synthetic-like DID method. Uh, or even, uh, even in the advanced form, we, uh, we are developing the technique where we can divide, subdivide the uh, 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 covariate space uh, to exploit the, day, uh, exploit the variation among all different level of covariates. And last part uh, of this presentation would be the empirical illustration of our method. So uh, we adopted Colley et al. 2021's paper where they investigated the pasture rate of the sugar sweetened beverage. So in their data set, they have control group and the treatment group and the control group was in the control group uh, in the between of uh, June and August, the July, at the, on July 1st, the tax was imposed and they were looking at the difference in uh, equilibrium prices so that how, much, how many proportion of the tax was induced uh, to the equilibrium price. So their, their, their data set has four, uh, four periods where there are two pre-treatment period, April and June, and two post-treatment period, August and October. So we are able to uh, construct the Mm, selection bias one uh, interval using those two pretreatment periods. And the outcome variable is the equilibrium price on the shelves. And let me show you the results uh, using the table here. Uh, the results are divided by the two cents, which means that these numbers are just the uh, uh, pasture rate. So this is the percentage of the mm, percentage of the uh, pasture rate of the tax. So uh, first of all, we see that uh, first two lines are uh, the standard DID outcome, and the third and fourth line is the lines are the 
lines are our uh, method result. And you can see here, if we see the point estimate and our bounds, we see that DID estimate is always contained in the our GDID set. That means our approach is always uh, robust to uh, uh, the standard DID method and our approach is using the weaker assumption. The second, if we can compare, uh, we can compare the competence interval as well. You see that our competence interval is always larger than the standard DID assumption, which was expected as well. But if we uh, take a look at this lower bound of the competence interval, we see that now under our approach, 0% is not rejected under the 5% of the significance level, or 100% is not rejected either. That means uh, the original results strongly rely on the para trend assumption, and uh, we need to uh, be careful about uh, interpreting the results from the standard DID assumption uh, approach. So uh, this was uh, this was my presentation, and to summarize, uh, well, I hope that uh, our method could be useful whenever the without for the paratrend assumption behind the data set, or whenever we see that the pretreatment of paratrend assumption fails, uh, I, I believe that we can provide some useful bound even if those assumptions are violated. Thank you so much. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so in the model you showed, you showed that the, the, the um, sample bias in one, in negative one time period and zero uh, was bigger than negative one and, and lower in zero. Um, so it kind of gives you this nice balance. Um, yes. You have, to, you have the upper bound um, by having negative one and then you have that lower bound by having zero. But if that was reversed and zero, and the zero time period was bigger, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you Following this, you'd still get the upper bound, but how reliable is that upper bound? So what we are doing is that not just picking up uh, some specific period, but we are just collecting all the possible selection bias that is available in the data set. And we just uh, take the convex hull of all the selection biases that is available in the data set. So uh, from that, we will select the largest selection uh, bias as the uh, upper bound of the selection bias, and we'll pick the smallest one as the lower bound. Do you think there's a time when the largest uh, sample bias would not be would be potentially still lower than the specific sample bias? That is also true. Like uh that's uh so if, if there is on other uh that <sighs> That's also true. So uh, it has to be uh, very careful when we uh, apply our method, but I believe that this is still uh, robust than the standard parallel trend assumption because that is still assuming a fixed single value of selection bias one, but we are, in in instead of doing that, we just uh, rely and we just allow that to have some specific bounds. Yes. Yeah, that was a nice Thank you so much. So the classical problem is statistics is a trade off among the type one type of error. And so here you've got a nice technique for cutting out on the type one error, but then mm. you pay a price for that. That is that is yeah, a very good point. Thank you. Yeah. So yes, I think yeah, that's a great point. And yeah, I need to I need to uh, think about some DGPs where, uh, where in, in what circumstances those type two uh, errors could be uh, uh, significant to enough to avoid our approach or not. That would be really important point to uh, in the investigative order. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is there anybody to consider this type of generalized in the previous work? So, so yeah, so I believe this is the first approach, uh, first, but the language generalized 
DID itself has been used. Like for example, if they, if we have a uh, multiple period, uh, there is some literature that is using generalized DID. So for now, we just named this as generalized. But uh, so yeah, if if. Yeah, we need to uh, maybe find another adequate naming for this one, but in this uh, this specific type of approach uh, that allows the selection bias to be very uh, the set between uh, within the pretreatment period is first, I believe. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for your presentation. I think that would be great paper if it is published. <laughs> that, that introduced a new concept in terms of the ID. Anyway, next one is second one is Mr. Un Un Sung Tae. Okay, let's start with uh, Mr. Eun Sung Tae's title, uh, the paper titled as The Impact of Dietary Choice on CO2 Emissions in Japan. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to my session, and especially my wife up there. <laughs> and I have almost 19 slides, so I have to shorten my version. Okay. Okay, as you know, agriculture's one of major sector is occurring CO2 emission in the global. So of course, supply and demand in agriculture is emit greenhouse gas emissions. For this fact, uh, agriculture usually took 23% of global, sorry, maybe, greenhouse gas emissions. And Japan usually 4% of their industry especially agriculture sector is for the greenhouse gas. And United States, usually agriculture took 11% of greenhouse gas emission. And I focused on non-medical determinants of six of them, usually as you see fat, calorie, and to the food supply for the human. Each factor uh, causes some, some amount of uh, CO2 equivalent per calorie, pure calorie. So it is a number 4.62, 2.2 gram uh, CO2 equivalent per pure calorie per carbonate drink. And there's an event I focused on 2011 March in Japan. East of Japan, there's earthquake and a Korean 15 meter tsunami and it hit land. And there's the enable, unable, you know, there was a six nuclear reactors and east side of Japan, and uh, there was cooling system failure, and there were some radioactive materials as spread out in the atmosphere at the time. It directly is uh, related to the food, food security problem. So here's another fact but through two graphs. Left one shows that the uh, uh, fission mix expenditure and right graph and shows uh, how much the Japanese people consume for the non-medical determinant with the six factors consume to each year. As you see, the fish consumption decreases and the consumption increases. And another graph shows the increase of both sugar, fruit, vegetable, and calorie things. And I try to use the causal inference, they include very good method, the ID, and other things I choose in synthesis control method. But the method I choose is useful because it can use be less sample, less than 50. And then the single treatment can be used and another multiple treatment can be used too. And this uh, flow scheme is show how my study works on. So there are two groups and treatment unit and control unit. Of course, Japan is my treatment unit and the other countries goes control. So I collect some data from in the pre-intervention pre period. 
uh, the predictors, uh, I collect them and make, make some possible weights as using V and W. So I use those two weights and another four factors to build a synthetic control unit. So the focus of this method is how will I build that synthetic control unit. So this optimal synthesis control unit, it depends on how similarity between treated and control. So this formula use my effective intervention is alpha, alpha head, it comes with difference between outcome, the outcome with exposed intervention and outcome without intervention. So I'll skip this one. So I use this data, uh, my dependent variable is sealed emissions per capita. Of course, I told you it treated is Japan. I collect another 25 countries for my control unit to build up synthetic control Japan. So I use 16 predictors through the GDP per capita through the non-medical determinant with the six, uh, six consumption of fruit and vegetable curry things. Uh, uh, I start with results from this slide. It shows how well my synthetic country unit will built. As you see, top of the table, Japan, and the other one, synthetic Japan. And those two the value shows how well my synthetic country unit is similar between those two. If the value is closer to each other, if those predictors is very well contributed to build a synthetic country unit. And real as the, the difference bigger between those two is not perfectly reproduced by the producer synthetic control unit. And then at, after the analysis, there is a, some weight. I already told you my flow scheme, I need two weights. So two weights shows, shows some, country, some countries in my country group, how will they contribute to the build of synthetic country unit? So as you see, the blue rectangle shows that those eight countries can be used to build up the synthetic country unit. So biggest one, the Czech Republic, uh, sorry, Germany is 33.6% 30, and let, uh, even there are Lithuania and Bulgaria and 0.1% contribution to the synthetic country unit. And those two graphs is my, uh, my visual so left one is comparison between the black line in Japan and red line is synthetic Japan. Of course, synthetic Japan comes with synthetic country unit with these 25 countries in my country group. So after the more shaded area is represent the pre-intervention time period and less shaded area is after intervention time period. So those two trajectory lines go the similar ways before the intervention, but after that, they go diverted in two different directions. So which means there is some, there is some event affecting the CO2 emission per capita in Japan. So my, my, my hypothesis is that there is some pattern, violent pattern, pattern affecting the CO2 emissions per capita. And right graph shows the gaps between the Japan and synthetic Japan, between before the intervention, after the intervention, before the intervention, there is almost zero difference between those two, but after intervention, as you see, the, so the biggest gap between those two. So from here, how I suppose my result uh, for the statistical significance. So I use plausible studies and the others. Those four graphs, I use mean skilled prediction error to exclude it countries showing more higher MSB values than Japan. So first up, up left graph shows all countries, 25 countries MSB value and lower right uh, graphs show only, I uh, excluded two times bigger countries showing MSB value in Japan. So after three steps, as you see, uh, almost six countries are left and that implies I can, this possibility of proximity of the uh, uh, supporting my graphs. This one over six is 0 0.0166. A one minus value is indicated my statistical significant is about 85%. And those two graphs can be used also to support my statistical significant 
left turn leave on a graph and right one is uh, pre post MS MSPE ratio over pre MSP ratio. So, so in the right graph in the Japan is the upper right side as you see that the Japan is uh, in the uh, red rectangle, which means the in Japan post MSP value is much higher than the pre MSP ratio value, which means there is some event is affecting the CO2 emission per capita in Japan. So this table also shows the MS, MSP ratio is as you see in the previous slide. So oh, this is my conclusion. So I, I, I concluded that dietary behavior is affected by various regions. So I picked one of them in non-medical determined health, those are six predictors. So as you, and then um, uh, literally there's consumption in Japan after the natural disaster, they, they fish consumption decreased, meat consumption increases. Also they imported more meat stuff. So that could affect their CO2 emission per capita. So the so down left side, as I told you before, I show 85% statistical significance by using my plasma studies and leave on our graphs and MSP ratio graphs. But the, the implication of my study, how, I, how can I more improve my statistical significance for supporting my, my hypothesis between the relation between the dietary pattern changes and the CO2 emission? So I did try after submission this paper, I changed the dependent variable, uh, dependent variable from the CO2 emission per capita to CO2 emission food household consumption. So I changed the dependent variable to related to food consumption, my statistical significant increase to 96%. So to use this SEM method, you need to choose very uh, construct a similarity. So to better construct a similarity, you choose uh, careful about predictors and the control group the countries. Thank you. Yes. I, I it doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yes. Uh, why would earthquakes change diet? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, there were March 2011, there were underworld earthquake and East Sea of Japan. And the earthquake has occurred 50 meter tsunami and the tsunami hit the east side of Japan, the land side. And there were nuclear reactor facilities, over six of them. And then after hitting that uh, tsunami by, by tsunami, they, the Japanese government cannot control the cooling system in the nuclear reactors. So after that, the nuclear meltdown is occurred and the nuclear you know, radio materials is spread out. After that time, there were contaminated food issues occurred in this area. The Japanese people not anymore spend the local food. They can usually use more fishes they consume in each every household. But after the time, they more cautious about the choosing the food. They always see that the inspection, uh, some kind of measures to avoid the, the nuclear active. So they did not less, they spend less fish and instead they spend more meat. Yeah, so that's why they changed they changed their direct patterns. Yes, another one. Yes. But you're very much focused on production of DHD, also the implied consumption of DHD Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you might do a consumption to production. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, thank you. Good point.
Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, we have enough time, so please, <laughs> then you ask some questions. Okay, and the third one is Miss Chan Younghyun Younghyun Jones. Yeah, Miss Younghyun Jones revealing the fundamental parameters of a food demand system using estimated elasticities. Um, hello everyone, my name is Yongyun John. I'm a first year PhD, PhD student at University of Missouri, Columbia. For this project, I'm working with Dr. Thompson, Dr. Huang, Dr. Evler, and Dr. Miller. Today, I'm gonna talk about revealing fundamental parameters of a food demand system using estimated elastic elasticities. Let me start by discussing the motivation of this study. The typical meta-analysis of demand elasticity elasticities has used linear regression models. They use elasticities as a dependent variable and each study specific method as the explanatory variables by making them dummy variables. While most of demand elasticities are from a demand system, this typical meta-analysis is not directly related to economic theory. They do not impose symmetry, adding up, or other theoretical demand constraints. So in this study, we estimate U.S. food demand elasticities based on a modified meta-analysis. Use elasticities from, from the past studies like the typical meta-analysis, However, for the regression models, we use the economic demand model instead of weighted list squares or ordinary list squares, which many typical meta-analysis used. So we use the, we use, we borrow the economic demand model for our meta-analysis. We choose the quadratic almost ideal demand system elasticity formula to allow for nonlinear expenditure effects. So let me, let me explain the model we use. These equations are the quadratic age elasticity formula. So we are gonna estimate the optimized fundamental parameters, which are beta, lambda, gamma, and alpha. Subscript i, j, and k indicate full items and s indicate the study s. Epsilon IS is the expenditure elasticity at the study S, and Epsilon IJS is the price elasticity at the study S. Also, we use MS, the total food atom expenditure, and WIS, the expenditure share of good I, and PS indicate the prices, the, the prices of each item. Um, also, Consistent with the quadratic age, age theory, AP and BP indicate the price indexes. Also, we impose symmetry, homogeneity, and adding up demand constraint on our parameters. Uh, let me briefly explain the data we use. As, depend, as a dependent variable, we use elasticities coming from 42 studies and, they, and undertake the data commercial steps to make all elasticities compatible. As explanatory variables, we need prices, total expenditure, and expenditure share of goods. So we use the historical market data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. For food items, we include alcoholic beverage, non-alcoholic beverage, fetch and oils, fruits and vegetables, grains, milk, milk and dairy, proteins, and sugars. This, uh, let me move on to our estimation result. This table shows the optimized fundamental parameters. So these parameters satisfy all equations simultaneously and minimize the sum of scaled errors. We, uh, we, we 
impose all constraints to, so the sum of alpha is one and the sum of beta is zero. Because of the symmetry, the gamma ij and gamma ji are equal. And then next, we calculate the pre predicted values, predicted elasticities using the fundamental parameters and historical market data. So this table shows the predicted elasticities with average values of market data during 2016 to 2020. During that period, um, the expenditure elasticities for alcoholic beverage is the most elastic. As expected, all items have the negative, negative on-price elasticities. Next, we calculate every single year price elasticities between, 20, between 1990 and 2020. As you can see, the most elastic item is sugars and the last elastic item is proteins. Lastly, we look at the shapes of the angle curves implied by the fundamental parameters. We calculate the budget shares of each item derived by the quadratic age demand model. We increase and decrease the expenditure term by 40% using food atom expenditure data. Let me summarize. We suggest a new meta analysis based on the quadratic age demand elasticity formula. So in doing so, we can maintain the same economic theory. However, there are possible considerations for improving on our work. For example, we can change our demand system from the quadratic age model to other demand system. We can shift to income elast elasticities instead of food at home expenditure elasticities. Or a single state demand system can be expanded to two state demand systems. So this concludes my presentation. This project is funded by the USA. Thank you for listening. Now I will take questions. I just wonder how those uh, the dependent variable elasticities are obtained from the previous uh, researches because you are imposing the QUA's demand system for this regression model, but what if they are obtained from more simpler ones like OES? Or oh, else? how how would that come Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So first of all, if one study estimate the protein foods or like grain food then it will be our observation. So it will be our dependent variable. But um, as you can see, every elasticity use different demand system. So, but most of um, elasticities are coming from the demand model, like AIDS model or Rotterdam or other demand system. So we think AIDS model might be appropriate, but also it, we can be changed from like, as our like future constellation, we can also change from AIDS, quadratic AIDS model to other demand system to fit where our observation. Yeah, but that's a great question, thank you. Uh, it's too fast rather than <laughs> much faster than I expected. Anyway, okay, next one is Mr. Sean, Sean Posey from Posey. Okay, the next presentation is separable for some testing for intra household separability by Mr. Sean Posey. Okay. Thank you all. Um, so yeah, I'm, test I'm presenting my paper uh, titled Separable for Some, Testing for Intra-Household Separability. 
Um, this is a paper that I'm working on with the fellow, uh, with the professor at the University of Georgia, um, Jeffrey Dorfman. Right. Um, so kind of just a quick summary of what the paper is, since I only have a few minutes to present it. Um, the main research question is, do households behave as a single firm? Uh, the typical ag household model kind of models the household as a singular firm. Um, and a lot of the literature that looks at uh, differences in production among uh, different managers in, uh, within households kind of hints that that might not be true. Um, and then the follow-up question is, uh, do members or do these unique firms, if they do exist in the household, um, do they experience unique barriers to markets? Um, and the way I get around, the uh, way I test for this is I look at uh, adapting two separability tests, um, the LaFave and Thomas 2016 and the Lee 2010, um, which I will show in the, later on. Um, I look at the impact and sensitivity of these models to um, intra-household separability using a Monte Carlo simulation to kind of look at if we are not testing at this, if we're testing at the household level, and my hypothesis is true that there is this intra-household separability, um, how much separability would completely cause these uh, models to fall apart, or would it continue to be um, saying that they are not, that, that it is separable, um, and that we are incorrectly identifying this household. And then I follow up in tests for uh, intra-household separability using a, a multi-country approach. All right, um, so why would we care about intra-household separability? Um, the main one is kind of the economic question uh, or the econometric question. Um, are separability models actually uh, detecting what we are, what is happening in the real world? Or, or are, we, uh, mis are, are we using uh, wrong assumptions about um, the household model itself? And how do we test for inter-household separability? How do we identify these firms? Um, and what would we even be looking at? Um, and the next is, why do we care about uh, separability um, in a more general question? Um, and that would be looking at uh, potential unintended policy effects. Uh, if a household is uh, identified as separable or if the area is identified as separable, um, but within there, there's uh, groups of people within the household who are non separable they could be having negative effects on them. And these people would be probably the members of society that are most vulnerable as well. Um, and then just kind of go over real quickly, because I didn't know how to find much time, um, what is separability? Um, separability is that uh, it, within the household model, um, the producers um, cannot make profit maximizing choices due to uh, market failures, uh, market barriers, or um, uh, incomplete markets. All right, um, so why do I think that there could be intra-household separability? Um, and we have a lot of literature to look at. I kind of picked a few of them. Um, the famous uh, Uber 1996, which looked at the non-cooperative model for the household and tested its assumptions, found that uh, households do not allocate resources um, optimally, and that specifically uh, female managed plots were undersupplied labor, while male plots were uh, oversupplied labor based on this unitary household model. Um, the next is uh, looking more at the managing level and looking at male managers, female managed plots, and uh, joint managed plots. And King et al. found that there's, uh, there's large differences in uh, crop choices, uh, inputs, um, as well as output making decisions based on who is managing that plot. Um, and then finally, on the consumption side, we see that uh, the manager of the plot uh, impacts uh, how consumption decisions are made after uh, after production shocks occur. Um, and Duplo and Udry find that uh, whenever male managed plots see a positive income shock, uh, more personal consumption is consumed in the household, while whenever female managed plots uh, see a positive production shock, uh, more household consumption is consumed. All right, um, so the big part of my paper is kind of uh, getting out to identifying these firms. And I kind of follow um, the literature with a ping at all and looking at these plot managers. Um, and the reason why I looked at it is, is because of all the literature on these gender differences and how there's known gender barriers or gender specific market barriers, um, mainly with access to credit, um, information uh, and inputs. Uh, and a big one of information is that uh, especially with extension, extension tends to be male dominant and excludes a lot of women from uh, attending. And the general assumption used to be that, oh, the, the husband will come home and train their wife. Um, but I have another paper that looks at intra-household information sharing, and that doesn't seem to be the case. 
Um, so there is even more so a barrier to information for, for women. Um, and then I look at these three managing uh, regimes, male, female, and joints, and then I test for interseparability at that level by adopting, adapting these uh, separability models. All right, um, so then I adapt these two models, um, the LeFebvre and Thomas, which is a uh, panel data, and looks at uh, and tests whether or not household um, demographics and composition, uh, mainly uh, number of members of the family and different age groups, and tests whether or not that is correlated with uh, labor demand. Um, and then the Lee, uh, the reason I added the Lee was because it's a non-panel, so there's a lot of data that you just don't have a panel for it, specifically gender disaggregated uh, panel data. Uh, so this would be another way of kind of adapting a new, a, a different model that can be used in other data, uh, data sets where uh, panel is not an option. Uh, and the Lee looks at uh, looking at the marginal, uh, marginal product of labor and testing whether or not uh, that is correlated with household composition and whether or not uh, shadow wage is equal to wage. Um, so the hypothesis test would be for the beta Thomas, beta equals zero. And for Lee, it forces the two, um, that beta equals zero and that, uh, or beta equals one and that alpha equals zero. So it's a little bit stronger uh, of a test. All right, um, so because I only thought I had seven minutes, so I kind of rushed it through. Um, the results are kind of still coming. I'm, I'm still working on this paper, um, but I've, I've run, I've ran the Monte Carlo simulation and I, I still need to add some tweaks, but the, the general thing is that um, separability, separability models are very sensitive to this intra-household probability, um, which would make a lot of sense uh, since it's looking at correlations and enforcing correlation. Um, for the Monte Carlo, I had, uh, I split it up for male and female plots, and I gave uh, female plots uh, to be smaller on average and um, to be fewer plots, um, kind of following the data sets as well um, that I've, I've looked at in, uh, through LSMS. And that's uh, whenever even a small amount of, uh, of uh, separability is kind of forced onto them, uh, we see that it starts rejecting quickly and the lead uh, rejects much faster than the Lepin Thomas. Um, and then from the multi-country approach, um, I've kind of only looked at Ethiopia so far, and even then I haven't really uh, spent the time to, to make it right. But from the preliminary results, we kind of see that uh, the overall, we find that most uh, households, even at the manager level, are non separable But uh, female managed plots, uh, specifically if you look at um, them, being female output managers, uh, meaning that they have kind of control over whether or not they can sell to the market from this plot, they are much more likely to be non sensible than uh, male or joint. And similarly, with uh, what uh, Kang et al. found as well, is that uh, joint um, plots are almost identical to male and plots. Um, they just kind of say that they're joint, uh, the men kind of are more uh, in charge. So kind of to quickly conclude, um, the, the point of this paper is that uh, current separability models kind of fail to account for this uh, intra-household, uh, multiple firms within the household um, by just kind of lumping it all together. And that's exactly that leads to bias results and uh, unintended policy effects um, where they kind of push market incentives, but they, uh, women don't have access to these markets and are left out. Um, and then I used uh, plot manager level separability tests. Um, or using plot manager level separability tests will allow for uh, more accurate representation of what uh, the household is actually doing. Um, and from my results, there is some evidence that these, these unique firms within the household uh, do actually exist. And that is my presentation. Could you provide an example of a policy that was actually implemented that did have unintended effects because of separability issues? <laughs> that's a that's a great question. Um, I can't think of any off the, the top of my head. Um, but I mean there would be some that would be focused on uh, technology adoption. Um, where you're kind of pushing information and training for new technologies, and this overwhelmingly uh, removes women from having access to that, and you start seeing this technology adoption gap where men are applying this technology to their plots and, and women are not. Um, 
you can, you can also see um, in some cases, uh, for example, I've been working in Ghana a lot and I've been pushing marketing uh, ground nuts uh, heavily. And what that's done is that what was traditionally considered a, a women's crop is now being pushed as a marketing crop and men have taken over that production. And women have been left behind to either switch to a different or that their ground nuts are often uh, much worse or susceptible to diseases. I, I thought, I mean, I thought about the boys in the third of the household level. If you have like all the things you look at, that would be other, you could get that some household level indicators that suggest some of the could be a pop all the data that you're using to look at the household care system or the results from that. And then they can allow other surveys where they have more household data than what we're talking Yes, um, so there's another paper that's uh, done by a colleague, uh, Jared Ferris, who looks at um, whether or not uh, plot, entertaining plots within a household causes uh, acceptability models to fail. And he shows that it does, um, and that's controlling for plot level. Uh, face effects kind of overcomes this and it kind of breaks it down with the, the plot level a little bit more. Um, but I'm not sure, um, I mean, it would be better to get acceptability tests at the individual plots because um, that is the smallest unit and um, it might be difficult to get that kind of data um, over a period of time because the plots will push them out um, and you might not, what they call the same plot might not be the same plot and might get some, some kind of measurement errors uh, through that, um, but I'm not sure uh, how, how feasible that would be at that point with the data. Well, I know with the Ethiopia data, it's incredibly difficult to get. Um, even with plot level data, it would be hard for me to just kind of pull out the plot data like this here. Yeah, so this is just kind of Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for your last presentation. And I have to apologize for my <laughs> confusing you because I had to prepare two papers, but I realized that the second one, the result of the second paper was not so good. And uh, most of the logics are consistent with my first paper. So today I will pre uh, I'll present just only one of my, my things. So yeah, I, I'm sorry to notify it to you. Anyway, today uh, I'm gonna present uh, my one of my research paper uh, titled as live stock price forecasting using long short term memory units uh, called as LSTM the case of ASF and the COVID-19 pandemic. Now here is the contents and research background was the uh, before COVID-19 pandemic, uh, ASF was very notorious uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in our country's case. The ASF was outbroken in China in 2018. And after that, as soon as, soon as it outbroke, it was, uh, was that it, uh, it also outbroke in Korea in, 19, uh, 20, in 2019, October. And it causes lots of problems like uh, ports, uh, pork imports. Pork imports was decreased by almost 20% and price. The problem was price. Price was low, uh, price lose by 40% in 2019. And just after just one month, it dropped in half after that. So this kind of price, volati uh, price, price volatility can cause some social cost problems. So uh, policy makers or some researchers are focusing on to predict the exact, exact price, uh, oh, sorry, provide some uh, exact price prediction model. So my object of this research is to develop livestock price prediction model. And uh, conventionally, uh, typical time series models are used for to, uh, 
to develop some kind of prediction model. However, uh, we were focusing on the introduce a new method titled as machine learning. So it is called as LSTM, long short term memory unit. And this is just a brief introduction of LSTM. So traditionally, deep learning, deep learning algorithm is used in the other fields and RNN, recurrent neural networks are also used. And LSTM is the one of the specific versions of RNN, RNNS. And the feature is that one of the characteristics of RNN or LSTM is that it can, it can combine the long memories uh, that while the other time series models are depending on the short-term memories like uh, Markov chain or some kind of short-term short autoregressive components. However, RNN or LSTM can, probe, uh, can use, can utilize the long memories. So anyway, there are some papers. Yeah, up to now, LSTM is used for image recognition or language learning and other fields. However, in the field of agriculture, it is barely introduced. However, recently, some Chinese researchers are introducing this kind of methodologies in our field. I'm oh, sorry, this is typo. And data, data is composed of four components, the livestock price and uh, African swine fever and COVID-19 because one of our interest was to how the price volatility could, could differ before and after COVID-19 pandemic. And the fourth is atypical data. Generally, it is generally used for developing this kind of LSTM or RNN model in, uh, in order to improve the prediction power in dealing with the machine learning process. Yeah, here is the, some brief algorithm. So fortunately, fortunately, R or TensorFlow or some kind of, a, uh, some kind of other utilities are providing very easy, uh, easy, utility, uh, ut easy packages. So in the case of R package, it is titled as Keras. So we, we just adopted the R package Keras and there are some processes about that. So I will skip those part anyway. The big title is data preparation and uh, all the data have different units. So we have to standardize like a uh, typical standardization using mean and standard deviation of some each, each time series, uh, each time observation, uh, sorry, each data observations. And after that, LSTM algorithm is typically, typically it is uh, what's that the predictor X and target Y. And in terms of both predictor and target, we construct a tensor. Tensor is composed of three, uh, three dimensional arrays like samples and time steps and features. Easily, easily speaking, samples is some observations to process the uh, process in using uh, LSTM. And time steps is legs, legged variable, uh, legged observations, and features is predicted variables. So typical tensor is composed of those three components. And layers, yeah, I'll skip those part. Anyways, the, our object was the LSTM is processed by minimizing some kind of loss function. And, and there are, we are considering two types of models. One is the univariate forecast object model. So that is just a univariate typical, uh, sorry, univariate, univariate LSTM models composed of only price, livestock price in here we are using the fork price. And second one is multivariate LSTM prediction. So with the regressors, like uh, some, uh, some kinds of this kind of data sets like ASF or COVID-19, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so, oh, oh, sorry, this is different device. <laughs> Just a second, sorry. <laughs> Even Not 
Yeah, here it is. Yeah, here is the results. So we were focusing on only pork price. The first one is the Unibrate model. And before then, our model looks like this. So first model is pork price only. That is called as Unibrate LSTM. And the other ones are multivariate LSTM. And as uh, regressors, we consider those variables here. And this is the typical structure of LSTM. And I'll skip this part because of time blackness. And here is the descriptive statistics uh, which were used for our analysis. And yeah, conclusion, uh, what's the results and conclusion. So Unibet LSTM, this uh, black line, black line shows them some kind of price volatility. And those are blue one, of course, the forecast, as you know, forecasting is not so perfect. So anyway, it, catch up, it catches some kind of seasonality up and down. However, it's not perfect. Anyway, that is the result of Unibet, Unibet LSTM. And we compare, we compare the mean absolute percentage error for uh, across the models. So here we could find, we could find this, some monotonicity, but, but as we add some regressors, regressors, the MAPE is decreasing. So it means that the prediction power is better and better. However, however, the differences, differences were not so, not so big. So, yeah, there is some limits for that. Anyway, this is summary. So multivariate LSTM can improve prediction power as you see this, uh, these tables. So, uh, but even though there exists some monotonicity, sometimes I was that this mon monotonicity can be violated both of two models. So it is not always perfect. Anyway, so multivariate LSTM can be considered to improve the prediction power and most like uh, before COVID-19, ASF was very problematic in the agricultural policy. However, after COVID-19, the human diseases are more problematic. So anyway, we uh, we wanted to uh, we wanted to make contributions in decompose the component of uh, livestock disease and human disease. Anyway, so there are limits and future work, not obvious difference among models in terms of MAP like that. So, however, 10% around 10% level is not, yeah, that can provide some good prediction, prediction power because uh, generally it is well known that LSTM, LSTM or other machine learning, machine learning predictions are better than typical time series models. Anyway, so not obvious difference among models and threshold models can be considered like uh, what's that, uh, follow ad adapting, adapting so typical, uh, typical time series models. Okay, yeah, that's my conclusion and here are some references. Okay, thanks very much and for your time. Okay, let me get some questions. Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry for that. <laughs> I skipped everything. So, no, yeah. okay. So here we considered some, what's that? So here, COVID-19 newly infected world level and in our country level, Korean, Korean cases and some kind of vaccinated, newly vaccinated people and the number of newly vaccinated people of the, our country. Yeah, well, the four variables are considered and because of the multicollinearity, I dropped some variable and I put some variables, whatever. Do you ever look at the, the like lag of it, the model, or is that the model? Sorry? Like, do you ever look at like lag? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the one of the characteristics of LSTM is if we want to twelve forward, uh, twelve forward steps, then in the under the LSTM scheme, so we can use the twelve legged legged observations. That's the powerful point of the LSTM, rather than the typical time series model. Yeah, you are pointing out my weakness. The second paper was about that. So I I tried the threshold vector error correction model, TVECM, but results were not so good. And uh, in the second paper, I'd like to distinguish the before pandemic and after pandemic, but 
Yeah, these are two ones so good. So I dropped the, I withdraw the paper. But as far as I know, the, the, the machine learning, machine learning process uh, provide much robust, much robust uh, prediction power rather than time series model because it is like a black box. So on, uh, until that we have some good prediction while the machine is processing and processing continuously. Okay. Yeah. So the version for your pizza and chicken slices, do you use curved slices and wide or only wide? Uh what's the legged, legged version. Because but the at the time the prediction I thought that maybe VAR or other kinds of time series model can be used for here, but only the LSTM, the MAP was not so good, rather than the what's the the other models like a model three and model four. So it's still, I'm curious about that. So, right, right. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, this. I have to check those things, but in the chicken. This is my just uh, just my <laughs> think uh, my uh, my thinking is that maybe chicken cannot be substituted for pork in Korea because pork and beef are substitutes each other. Maybe. Oh, but, just a pure people with potato chips have as many of right, right, but. Uh, I don't know if you're comparing the same Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask about it. Okay. No questions anymore. Okay, uh, we have to finish today's session here. Okay, thanks for the thanks for your time and favor for us. Anyway, thanks for everybody and your, all the presenters. Please give a huge applause to presenters. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, this is yours? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did my internship with uh, 
precision uh, development uh, and Ethiopia uh, and uh, uh, Ethiopia is very poor. Um, and so like I was kind of expecting that level when I got to Ghana. I arrived in Ghana in a capital city, which looks like it's really nice. And I got here, I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then I traveled to the north and I was like, okay, now the, the level the difference in the economy is much uh, it comes from USAID and uh, be the future. Yeah, so Georgia has the peanut innovation lab. And it's been a great experience, but it's been very hectic, especially with, especially with COVID. Like, it's just been, everything got pushed back, couldn't travel, um, couldn't even resume research in the field. So trying to push research forward while being forced to travel was really difficult. Yeah, so we had to, yeah, we had to apply for, like, uh, like, yeah, like, you want to do it, yeah, no cost extensions. We had to figure out how we're even going to start importing things to Ghana while not allowed to work on the project. So, like, yeah, like, how do we get around that? It's like a whole research fund. So, it was, it was a great experience. I, I hope I don't do it again. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah. So which of the Oh, it's uh 